Hey everyone, it's Ross, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk all about fruits, vegetables, really the unique stuff, things you never heard about, things you'd be surprised to learn, and really all involving fruits and vegetables. So in this video, in this podcast episode, I want to talk about the five most easiest to grow fruits, perennial fruits that you can grow in your backyard um, that's really just problem free that I think a lot of beginners, a lot of newbies would really love to know what's easy to grow so that when they try certain things for the first time it just seems really simple the yields are high, the reward is high and then it kinda is like a gateway fruit into other fruits and vegetables so I think in the next episode we'll probably talk about uh, the five vegetables that I would recommend for new gardeners so stay tuned for this if you guys are interested and want to see more about this particular topic tune into next week so for this episode though you can see right in front of me this is a real nice bowl of berries that I had grown myself um, I don't remember what time of the year this was. I think maybe in August or something. And I had taken a nice little road trip and this was my nice snack uh, that I took with me. I mean, there's some tomatoes in there. Uh, there's also goji berries in there. You can kind of see them right here. And there's some uh, nice little raisins. And th actually, they're, they're not raisins that I've, I grew myself, right? I didn't grow the grapes myself. But I have grown grapes myself and have made them into raisins. And I have to tell you guys, uh, growing grapes and turning them into raisins is in, is incredible. Um, some of the best raisins you've ever eaten. Way better than the sun made that you can get at the store. But just about everything we grow, guys, is better than the store. There are very few exceptions, uh, at least in fruits, that I would say. Uh, maybe cherries is pretty close to store quality store quality could be even better than some cherries that you're able to grow at home however mostly everything is really just so easy um, not easy but the the quality is so far superior that it doesn't really make sense to buy things at the store I find myself now five six years later into growing my own food really not buying a whole lot of things from the store I've become a bit of a prima donna uh, become a bit spoiled uh, the flavor is just not there and it I don't know if it's the flavor maybe it's the nutrients but my body when I see these things doesn't crave them um, I pass them by very quickly in the store in the grocery store and uh, I have to say I'm very thankful to have what I have so in this bowl though is a, is a bowl of basically berries and that's the first thing I want to say is that Virtually any berry you want to grow is extremely easy to grow. Um, there's a whole crap ton of berries that you probably didn't think existed that are not in this bowl. Um, you know, these are the more common ones here: the blueberries, the raspberries, the blackberries. You know, the strawberries. They're very common. They're also quite easy to grow. I'd say blueberries are a bit more on the difficult side. But there's even things like currants, uh, which I think are considered berries gooseberries honeyberries or hascap berries there's also june berries or saskatoons um there's elderberry there's aronia berry oh my goodness there's so many berries out there that you could get a bit overwhelmed um but for the most part the first thing i want to the first berry i want to talk about actually is raspberries raspberries are so easy to grow here it's a joke um i get about a bowl of raspberries every day um, I would say about, you know, yay big for those of you guys who are watching me on um, on YouTube. And I would say, you know, that's enough for one person to eat enough raspberries every day to the point where they're going to get sick of them and not want to eat them. Um, I really do, at a certain point in the season, get sick of them and, and can't keep up with the amount of fruit that they put out. Um, and that's only from two plants. You know, I keep them very well pruned. They don't take up a lot of space. Um, 
two plants will take up a, a, a two foot by four foot space. That's it. And that's enough to feed me enough raspberries to the point where I, I would throw up if I ate any more. So, you know, they're so easy to grow. There's nothing that bothers them. And basically everything I'm going to mention here, nothing bothers these things um, in terms of disease. Um, they're also very easy to grow, right? They're mostly problem-free in terms of pests. And they're mostly, in my climate, I don't have to water these things at all. I, in fact, anything in the ground, I do not water one little bit. We get about 40 inches of rain annually, and that's enough um, with the help of mulch. And mulching heavily, really, you don't have to water anything. So um, I'd strongly encourage you guys, if you live in a place that's a bit more dry or arid than where I live, yeah, you may have to water these things. But please do mulch. It's so, so easy to just put that down. Um, I always make the kind of analogy or the, it's, it's very similar when you plant a tree you put in the work the effort when you plant the tree so that down the road you don't have to really put in that work it really is that simple it's the same thing with mulching it's the same thing with many things uh, in gardening um, I would say though with raspberries and we're gonna get to blackberries in a second here is that you really just have to know how to train them and how to prune them and that's really the only learning curve there is. Uh, you also are going to have to protect them, most likely, unless you live in a very, um, you know, city-like atmosphere. You really do are going to have to protect them from the birds because they're red. Birds love that red fruit. Um, I'd also recommend for blackberries and raspberries get yourself some primocane types that ripen later in the season, um, sometime around, you know late July or August or maybe even mid August or something like that the birds in my area disappear um, well they don't really disappear but they stop eating a lot of these red red fruits so for me raspberries yeah they do start for me very early in the season probably sometime in, in, um, in June like mid June um, somewhere around there but most of those berries are, are quite few in terms of the varieties that I'm growing. I grow Heritage and Caroline. We don't really get much of a first crop off of those but the because the birds mostly get most of that. And then as we go and progress throughout the season, the birds disappear. And then sometime around August and onwards, so from August all the way to November 1st, I'm getting a bowl of raspberries every day. And nothing bothers them. I don't have any problems with, uh, well, I do have some problems with a fruit fly. But other than that, if you're on top of the picking, you don't let any of the fruit touch the ground or ferment or get overripe, uh, you shouldn't have any problems. The next fruit is the blackberry. Uh, very similar to the raspberry in almost all respects. Um, there's not really much else different about it except for when they ripen. Um, the limited number of varieties you can have access to that are primocane, which mean they will fruit on um, New Year's canes, which then at the end of the year in the fall, that's when they fruit. Otherwise, most varieties will fruit for you on second year canes and um, they'll fruit for you much earlier in the season. And then much earlier in the season though means you have to compete with the birds. And also that really aligns in my climate really aligns up well with um, SWD or that, that fruit fly that I was mentioning. But other than that, there's no disease pressure. They're completely hardy to my zone. I would say zone seven is really a good zone for both blackberries and raspberries. Uh, if you get a bit colder than that, it's very simple. You just take them down off the trellis, put them on the ground and mulch them. And then that way they're protected from any kind of cold damage. When it comes uh, back to spring, put the canes back up on the trellis and you're good to go. I mean, there's literally nothing that I do to these guys in my climate. It's almost zero. So I, I do a couple snips, do a couple, uh, you know, tie this to that wire and then that's it. Um, it's really that simple. The next fruit I want to talk about is the strawberry. Oh my goodness, is the strawberry, homegrown strawberries, way better than the store. Um, I would say Raspberries and blackberries are definitely far superior to store-bought quality, but the strawberries are inc are far and away 
better than the store to the point where I will still eat a store-bought raspberry or blackberry um, but I will not eat a store-bought strawberry there's a there's there are some things that I just will refuse to eat tomatoes is another one um, you know that comes to mind I would say strawberries though are probably the easiest thing that I grow uh, it's such a joke there's nothing that bothers them at all that um, I can't believe people still buy them at the store I, I it just blows my mind it really does so the deal with the strawberries is that yes they will take over your yard if you yet if you let them but they're then competing with the grass right and you can always take your lawnmower and mow them you know uh, if you keep mowing them down they're not gonna go into your grass they're just not they send out runners the runners then try to get into the grass and root themselves if you have a weed whacker you can weed whack around the bed and you will co completely stop those strawberries from getting in um, into your yard it's that simple um, I don't know why people are afraid of these things the, you plant one of them and it turns into hundreds of them in no time um, they're also affordable so are the raspberries and blackberries right if I want to get them at the store I could get 25 blackberry plants for 10 bucks uh, if you get them at Home Depot it's way more money I don't know why people do that uh, they just don't know um, I guess but uh, if you want to get any of this stuff at the store raspberries blackberries strawberries pay attention to the variety get them from online nurseries and have them have them ship it to you bare rooted dormant look excuse me guys they'll come to you early spring and uh, you don't have to worry about it you don't have to go to Home Depot there's nothing to think about I mean it's really really simple this way also there's nothing that bothers them in my climate I know some people have had disease problems with certain varieties uh, but for most for the most part even with the ton of rain that we get the lot high humidity we have I have no disease problems um, also the fruits incredible absolutely incredible uh, it also covers a really long harvest period so I would say from uh, the end of May or mid May is when my June bearing strawberries start even though they're called June bearers they do start a bit earlier for me and probably earlier for a lot of you guys but those guys bear once right they'll put out a huge crop and that's exactly what this is in the photo it's a huge crop of them all at once you can't even keep up with them at a certain point um, as tasty as they are even with a family of people you can't keep up with them so what I do is I go out there every day and pick them and then I'll, I'll put them in um, the freezer make jam out of them and it's an incredible jam you don't need to add anything like pectin um, you may need you're gonna want to obviously add some sugar but whew, they are uh, just an overall impressive fruit and then so they'll bear from mid-may in uh, in most years probably till the end of uh, the end of June and that's about a you know a nice little month and a half to a month window there and then my my other strawberries that I have which are either day neutrals or ever bearing those also bear but in limited quantity at that time of the year and then they kind of take a break um, then you have to wait a little bit maybe till August and then they start putting out crazy amounts of fruit to the point where from August again all August all the way to my last my first frost which is November 1st I have blackberries raspberries and strawberries producing for me every single day uh, to the point where I would never go hungry, right? I don't have to worry about food. I don't. I, I have a nice little safety net if, for whatever reason, the world ended, right? I've got these things that ripen for me every day. Um, so again, I mean, really problem-free. Nothing bothers them other than the critters, but because they're on the ground, it's very easy to protect them. Uh, what I like to do is actually put just a bird net over them. And that way, none of the squirrels, the groundhogs, the skunks, we, yeah, the skunks like them too. Um, even rabbits, I guess, will probably eat them. But birds specifically will not get these fruits, and you'll be able to enjoy them very easily with a simple bird net um, that you take a garden staple and staple that into the ground. It's real simple. Uh, the next fruit I want to mention here is the mulberry. We talked a lot about mulberries, guys, especially on my YouTube channel. 
Uh, we have a couple more. We have one mulberry tree that's massive, and that's usually what they get. Is huge. They're very ornamental. Absolutely nothing bothers them except for the birds. Uh, maybe some squirrels, depending on the time of the year. But uh, because they're so big, they're hard to protect from the birds. So it's it becomes a bit of a challenge. Myself, um, you can put a bird net over it, but that netting has got to stay on there for the remainder of the season. Otherwise, you can't get it off. Um, now, I am getting some dwarf varieties, which I've talked about at great length. It's called Girardi Dwarf Mulberry. And these will grow in my climate as well as actually be a true dwarf that I can then net very easily and protect them from the birds. Um, it's very similar to a blackberry, I would say, in terms of uh, appearance, sort of in terms of taste as well, but they it's its own fruit, right? You got to taste them to understand it. Most people don't understand them because you don't see them in the store. They have a very low shelf life. So this is something you're never going to get in the store, but it's extremely easy to grow. It grows in pretty much every climate. Same thing with the strawberries, same thing with the blackberries, same thing with the raspberries. You can grow them in almost anywhere in the United States. Um, there's different species you may want to look out for, right? Variety is important as well as species is very important in terms of the, the mulberry here. But again, it's a really tasty fruit and overlooked because most people who have experiences with mulberries, the few that do... Um, are used to seedlings or ornamental trees. And when those produce fruit, they are completely tasteless. I had a seedling tree myself that just came up in my yard. I let it fruit. Uh, it was cardboard. There was no flavor whatsoever. I promise you the bread ones, the varieties that have been cultivated for hundreds of years, um, hundreds of years, have great flavor. Uh, in my mind, they're better than a blackberry. So... And they grow on a tree, which is pretty cool, right? Little different. Um, and just as interesting as a blackberry, if you ask me. Next fruit. We got the persimmon. This is number five. So we're at the end here. Um, the persimmon is the easiest fruit, I think, in my climate. Um, you know what? I think it is because at the end of the season... Most of the birds are gone. Uh, you probably may have to worry about some squirrels, but in my yard, I don't really have to worry about them. Um, you do have to worry about deer, but if your tree is large enough and you don't have a high deer infested area, you don't got to worry about it. These things produce year after year. Nothing bothers them. There's no disease that hits them. They're very ornamental trees as well. They're beautiful trees absolutely beautiful they also produce a crop that's very late in the season that fills a nice little gap you can have these guys you know probably starting at the earliest sometime in september here in my climate and then once you get them in september you could be eating them fresh but there's some later varieties as an example that may not ripen until maybe even late october mid-november maybe even some in, in early december and they get hit with that frost, the leaves will fall off. And then you're left with these orange globes, these beautiful orange globes hanging on this beautiful structure of a tree. And usually around Thanksgiving, you're going to have yourself a huge persimmon harvest that then you can um, either eat them all there, which is probably impossible, but they also last for quite a, quite a long time. The shelf life is, is pretty extraordinary. Um, you know, they're not as crazy as something like an apple or a pear, but you can then dry them. And something that I love to do is dry these guys. You can dry them whole. You can string them up kind of like a pepper or a tomato, like a lot of Italian people do. Hang them up in a well-ventilated, uh, cool area of your house. And they'll dry whole. Um, or you can put them in a food dehydrator, which is what I do. I mean, I do want to dry some, um, actually, on in the house, some you know, as a as a whole fruit. I'm definitely going to do that at some point. I think it's better that way. Um, the sugar is probably a bit higher. There's a bit more flavor, right? It's a bit more natural. But uh, the dehydrator 
A dehydrated persimmon is incredible, guys. I'm telling you. You can cut it up many different ways, too. You can dry them whole, like I said. You can cut them up into chunks. You can cut them up into really thin slices, kind of like you would chop a... Uh, kind of like a really thin slice of an apple. You know? Um, and they come out in these little strips, these circular strips that are just to die for. I mean, it really is the best dried fruit that you can grow in a lot of climates and th these trees go all the way down to zone four zone five and uh it's incredible so anyway guys thank you so much for watching this one this episode of fruit talk i'll talk to you all soon take care everyone